The subcommittee will come to order. I welcome ranking member Lankford, members of the committee and our witnesses today. We are examining strategies for improving critical energy infrastructure in the United States. This topic represents a key issue for Arizona, Oklahoma, and the rest of the nation. Our businesses, communities, and families need a reliable energy grid to succeed. However, this past year has brought severe weather and storms to every corner of our country, leaving families victim to the elements when the electrical grid goes dark. These outages prevent a present a financial cost to American families and businesses, with the American Society of Civil Engineers estimating that power outages cost U.S. data centers $8,851 for each minute of a disruption, and that the cost of each outage results in $42,000 in losses for the manufacturing sector. These outages also lead to deaths, and while sometimes grid failure is unavoidable, one death is too many. I support an all of the above energy approach that maintains reliability, affordability, and safety. And that's why I was proud our bipartisan infrastructure package includes funding for grid infrastructure, resiliency, and reliability. New money to support supply chains and clean energy technology, including battery research and manufacturing, and investments in fuels and technology infrastructure, including CCUS, hydrogen research and production, a civil nuclear credit program, and hydropower efficiency incentives. Finally, we were able to make the Federal Permitting Improving, Improvement Steering Council permanent and expand access to tribes, Alaska Native corporations, and Hawaii Native organizations, so projects that improve America's energy infrastructure can be completed without needless delay. In Arizona, we are proud of the progress our utilities have made to utilize cleaner energy sources. My state has been a leader in integrating demand response into the grid, which has been a key component in maintaining grid operations and affordable pricing during the increasingly hot summers of the past two years. Arizona also has the highest solar potential in the nation, and I've supported the growth of the solar industry and the economic opportunities it brings to Arizonans. However, I recognize the challenges an intermittent resource like solar can present. And that's why I support increased investments in battery storage and implementing technologies that enhance grid flexibility and resilience. By utilizing these programs, such as the Permitting Council, and funds made available through our bipartisan work to improve America's infrastructure, we can make sure that extreme weather events do not cost Americans money, and more importantly, that a grid failure does not result in death. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and now I'll call on Ranking Member Lankford for his opening statement. It looks like we may not have Ranking Member Lankford with us yet, so I'd like to turn to Ranking Member Portman for his opening statement. Great, thank you so much, uh, Senator Sinema, and, and Senator Lankford is coming soon, I think, and to both of you, we appreciate you holding this subcommittee hearing on a really important topic. Uh, it's been great to work with you on these issues. Our energy infrastructure is so critical, and as you say, it's under threat so much now, particularly with all the natural disasters. Uh, we work together on broader infrastructure issues, roads, bridges, and so on, but we also need to think about our energy infrastructure and be sure it's able to deliver that reliable and affordable energy to our homes and our communities, uh, which our national security depends on, certainly our economic prosperity depends on. Senator Sinema and I, along with eight of our colleagues, uh, partnered on this Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Senator Carper and others very involved in this, uh, and it does provide a $65 billion investment into our energy infrastructure and our electric grid. The larger bill includes something else that I think is very important and I know will be a topic of today's hearing, and that's how to ensure that as we're moving forward with energy infrastructure, we're doing it in a more cost-effective way so the federal dollar can be stretched further. Uh, along those lines, Senator Sinema and I introduced what's called the Federal Permitting Reform and Jobs Act earlier this year. It basically lists the sunset on a program that has been in place for the last several years that has worked very well. We make that program permanent. It's called FAST 41, referring to the uh, the FAST Act, which was the uh, uh, the Surface Transportation Bill. Title 41 of it is a, a proposal that Senator McCaskill, out of this committee, and I worked on uh, back in 2014 and 2015, 
And it's a common sense way to bring agencies together at the start of a permitting process for some of our largest infrastructure projects to develop a transparent timeline, hold them accountable to it, also establishes the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council. By the way, one of our witnesses today I see, uh, Madam Chair, is uh, Alex Hergott, who was executive director of that group, and, and he continues to work on these issues. Uh, the notion is to help resolve conflicts between agencies on projects and develop permitting best practices, speeding up permitting, not going around the permitting requirements, but doing so in a much more cost-effective way. And because the system has been so complicated, that's easy to do. To give you one example of this, the FAST 41 programs have reduced the NEPA review process from four and a half years on average to two and a half years on average for covered projects. By the way, that's a 45% savings, which represents billions of dollars in savings. So this is one thing that's working in our federal government, faster, more effective permitting, green lighting projects, and particularly for energy infrastructure, this has been critical. It, and again, it does too without reducing any environmental or safety standards. The Senate passed a larger infrastructure bill, of course, with 69 votes way back in August, more than two and a half months ago. Our hope is that even in the next few days, we may see that legislation pass the United States House of Representatives. I certainly hope so, because it's critical to fixing our crumbling infrastructure and strengthening our economy. But again, it also fixes our nation's core infrastructure, including energy infrastructure, without raising taxes or adding to inflation while helping our economy grow in the long term. So I really appreciate your holding the hearing today. Uh, and to you and Senator Langford, uh, it's always a pleasure to work with both of you. My uh, hope is that we'll get into some good Q&A today with some of your witnesses and learn more about how we can indeed improve our critical energy infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks so much um, uh, to our Ranking Member Portman. I believe that Ranking Member Langford is back on after some tef technical difficulties. Ranking Member Langford, if you're back on, I'd like to turn the time to you for an opening statement. Nope, still no. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to him when his uh, technical difficulties are done. So we're going to go ahead and start by swearing in our committee. So it is the practice of this committee to swear in witnesses. So all of our witnesses today, if you'll please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. I do. Yes. Yes. Thank you. We'll now hear from our witnesses. So I'll ask each of our witnesses to keep their remarks to five minutes. Your full written statements will be entered into the hearing record. So our first witness is Alex Hergott. Mr. Hergott is the president and CEO of the Permitting Institute. He was the first executive director of the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council and is a former deputy staff director of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Welcome, Mr. Hergott, and you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sinema, Ranking Member Langford, my name is Alex Hergott, and I serve as the president of the Permit Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on simplifying the permitting process so they can rebuild, expand, and modernize America's aging infrastructure while preserving our environmental, cultural, and historic resources. While we are, are based here in Washington, D.C., the Permitting Institute's most important work happens across the country, in the field, in Arizona, in Ohio. We help our members navigate an overly complicated process, work with you on achievable reforms, and train the next generation of government regulators and project developers. Fortunately, volatility in our energy markets continues to increase as we transition from conventional to renewable energy sources. And much of the energy infrastructure required to head off an emerging energy crisis this winter remain idle in various stages of planning and development. This mismatch of supply and demand is responsible for the rapidly increasing cost of energy Nearly half of all Americans rely on natural gas to heat their homes. And as we all are aware, the price of natural gas has nearly doubled since the beginning of the year and is expected to jump even higher this winter. Rising energy costs have placed a spotlight on the need for new, clean, affordable, and reliable sources of energy and transmission. The hundreds of new projects to meet this imperative, many which are shovel ready, must routinely overcome a maze of permitting obstacles, which developers report at 20 to 30% of project costs. Costs that are passed on in the form of higher taxes, and escalating utility rates. Nobody wins under the current system. Not the environment, not the distressed US electricity grid, not the ratepayers, and not the vulnerable communities who can least afford it, the small businesses, the farmers, the manufacturers, and the American families that ultimately bear the burden. Project developers, including many of our members, stand ready to pursue 600 to 800 billion in private investment for new wind, solar transmission, storage, and carbon capture. That's 200 to 300 gigawatts of new utility scale renewable energy generating capacity, enough to power 30 million homes. 
The reality, however, is the benefits of projects initiated today won't be realized for seven to 10 years because of the current permitting process. This includes billions of new offshore wind projects that are ready to go, but yet to receive their preliminary permitting timetable. Also proposed onshore renewable energy projects, largely in Arizona, Nevada, uh, and the West, um, are also on hold as BLM staffing decreases and other key issues keep projects in limbo to the point where inaction serves as a de facto rejection. Once these projects do begin the formal process, many still are snarled for years in bureaucratic and legal gridlock. One telling example is a $3 billion investment in a clean energy transmission line that began the permitting process more than a decade ago. It underwent seven years of review and was finally deemed complete by the federal government four years ago. However, it's now entangled in court proceedings because one of the 49 participating agencies pursued a, a separate programmatic workflow that renders the prior approval for this project moot. All because agencies in the same department didn't know what the other were doing. This is not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is a process issue. The lack of a predictable permitting process is the enemy of progress. And that uncertainty is keeping hundreds of billions of new U.S. investments from getting off the sidelines and investing in more cost efficient and next generation infrastructure, which I know Chairman Sinema and Ranking, Ranking Member Portman have spent a tremendous amount of time trying to reverse. This also impacts the impact of any new public spending that we may see from an emerging infrastructure package. The Permian Institute is building a large coalition of diverse entities committed to achieving a balance between progress and protection. We are working with developers in every affected industry sector, officials at all level of government, tribes, non-governmental organizations, and community leaders to identify common goals that deliver permitting wins. But to achieve this balance, we must untangle the web of the overlapping regulatory and statutory requirements some enacted over 50 years ago that are in critical need of modern revision. The key to greater coordination and efficiency is not limits on public stakeholder participation or shortcuts to laws and regulations. More comprehensive and lasting reform efforts in the past have been blocked by the notion that faster means, <clears throat> means fewer protections for the environment. This notion is simply false. There are no steps to skip for these highly scrutinized reviews for these large complicated projects. Project developers must always comply with all the relevant environmental statutes. There's no shortcuts, just avoidable process delays. To overcome this political impasse to progress, Congress can start small with a seven-year pilot program to test innovative policies on a targeted list of projects critical to our nation's energy needs. This temporary new authority will create room to experiment with expedited project approvals. Outcomes can be scrutinized by this committee and others, studied by the whole of Congress for feasibility, and then converted into more lasting reforms. We should also look to expand local and tribal partnerships and state permitting councils. Early this year, the Permian Institute successfully adopted um, in Arizona the introduction of a state permitting office focused on bridging the trust, communication, and the coordination gap between state and federal regulators. Thank you, Chairman Sinema. To be clear, opportunities for progress are directly in front of us. Over the past decade, Congress took the first steps through the creation of the Federal Improvement Steering Council and through the improvements offered in the one set federal decision framework. A confession is good for the soul. This is not enough. We have way more work to do. To conclude, if we agree that a project development cycle of seven to 10 years is simply too long, we must move past the fringe talking points and take the next steps together. By doing so, we will unlock the opportunity to modernize and uh, to modern and expanded energy infrastructure, an effort that will safeguard communities, protect the environment, and move us closer to President Biden's clean energy goals, while simultaneously securing new domestic sources of affordable energy creating jobs and bringing American industry to life. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hergott. I'd like to recognize Ranking Member Lankford for his opening statement. Senator Lankford, I hope that we're good on technical difficulties. So the time is turned to you now. Thank you. I believe we are good on technical difficulties. At some point, we'll all be able to do face-to-face -face hearings again, and uh, that'll be a, a good day for that. So thank you. Thank you as well for uh, Chairman Sinema for holding this hearing. Uh, it's incredibly important for grid reliability. We've got to be able to make sure we have adequate energy supply. As many as you may know, uh, last year in Oklahoma and much of the country, especially in all of the plains there in the Midwest, faced unseasonably extremely cold weather and uh, all the winter pre uh, precipitation that challenged our grid and energy supply left many people in the dark uh, in the coldest time of the year last February. I frequently say that Oklahoma is the Saudi Arabia of winds. It's about 40% of our electricity comes from wind annually. But during that period of time last February, despite all of our wind infrastructure, wind fell off the grid like a switch had been flipped. 
Meanwhile, coal, which usually is less than 20% of our generation, shot up to provide over 50% of our power. Oklahoma is truly an all the above energy state. Uh, we have wind, we have solar, we have hydroelectric, we have geothermal, we have diesel, uh, we have natural gas, we have coal. Uh, it, it's very important to us to be able to name that type of energy diversity for us. And I've, uh, I'm very interested in the issues that happened last year, uh, where we have weaknesses in our system and how we can actually learn from that. Uh, there's a lot that we still need to be able to go through in the days ahead. As I'm watching what's happening in other parts of the world right now, for instance, in the UK, their prices of energy have shut up dramatically. They're reducing reliability. What's happening in California right now, they're having reliability issues. Uh, even China is battling an energy crisis right, th right now where they're dropping their energy usage across uh, all of China and trying to be able to deal with certain provinces, only certain days that they can actually use power. So it's a very significant issue that's happening worldwide. And I want to be able to track and see how we in the United States can make sure that we can maintain power, re maintain reliability for the protection of human life in very cold and very hot days, um, but also for consistency and actual economic development, manufacturing, all the things that are also important to us. Now, there's been some consideration for renewable energy tax credits, uh, what that looks like in the days ahead. I hope we'll have an opportunity to be able to talk through some of those things. As I've already heard mentioned, some of the permitting issues uh, that are out there that are very significant because none of these projects begin and end in a year. Uh, we have to be able to deal with basic distortions in our system as we look on the horizon and see are we over accomplishing some areas and not using some others uh, for our energy developments. So all these are issues I hope to be able to address today as we deal with the responsibility that this particular subcommittee has on energy diversity for our nation and how we can protect uh, our nation and our economy with a diverse energy portfolio to make sure that that is stable. So, uh, Chair Sinema, thank you again uh, for leading out on this. Look forward to the ongoing conversation in the uh, hours ahead. Thanks so much, uh, Senator Lankford. So I'll go um, to, on to introduce our second witness, Bryce Yonker. Mr. Yonker is the executive director and the CEO for Grid Forward. Grid Forward maintains over 100 members from utilities, technology providers, national labs, investors, nonprofits, universities, and other advanced grid stakeholders. Uh, welcome, Mr. Yonker, and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Lankford. Ranking Member Portman, members of the subcommittee for the opportunity. My name is Bryce Yonker and I'm executive director and CEO of Grid Forward. As you said, an industry organization working to accelerate grid modernization and innovation. The electric grid is considered the most important engineering achievement of the 20th century. It's the backbone by which we build and sustain our lives, communities, business, and indeed society. However, we are not investing in the grid nearly enough to meet the demands we place on it. The Association for Civil Engineers predicts that in less than eight years, we will have underinvested in the grid by about $200 billion. Should we be surprised by the grid impacts that happened over the last nine months from overwhelming events such as winter storms, unprecedented heat, wildfires, a pipeline cyber attack, and major storms that have already been discussed? NOAA reports that the U.S. has had 18 climate we weather and related disasters so far this year, costing U.S. communities more than a billion dollars in damages each after record damages of $100 billion from 22 events last year. At the same time, market dynamics are changing faster than ever before. Customers are buying into energy options ranging from th smart thermostats to electric vehicles. Economics and policy drivers are accelerating the energy transition to resources like wind, solar, and batteries rapidly. In the midst of this change, operators are trying to make do with 20th century assets that in many instances are past their useful lives. For the last decade, we have helped to promote and accelerate a toolbox of advanced grid applications that are ready to be implemented at scale. I will summarize my remarks in four classes of capabilities. Forecasting, monitoring, planning, and deployment. First, advanced forecasting. Simulation, advanced algorithms, supercomputers, and other technologies are helping us forecast future events depending on a variety of factors. For the electric grid, the industry is getting better at forecasting both supply and demand. Indeed, keeping customer demand and electricity supply dynamically in balance is the basic equation for reliable power. However, outlier events that have been considered statistically improbable are becoming more frequent. For example, the heat dome I experienced in Oregon this summer with temperatures in the 115 degree range right outside my door here beat our previous high temperatures by eight degrees. With these events increasing in frequency and impact, we need more sophisticated, higher resolution forecasting to keep the grid in balance. Second, real-time monitoring. Advanced sensing capabilities allow grid operators to see in near real-time conditions of the grid that previously could only be determined through slow, manual, in-person inspection. 
Operators can track the health of assets of the grid, such as rotting or damaged poles, abnormal electric currents, trees in contact with lines, and much more. We must now move into advanced and automated controls of our electric grid system so that real-time awareness leads to fast action for enhanced grid reliability. Third, strategic planning. Today's planning frontier needs to consider such a large number of factors that it must be approached as a living set of contingencies and, ad and ad adaptive strategies. Unfortunately, many, if not most, communities do not have adequate resiliency action plans, let alone installed grid flexibility solutions to adapt to circumstances they are already facing. Grid operators and communities need to support to, de to develop broader strategic plans with actionable roadmaps to meet tomorrow's challenges. Fourth and finally, grid enhancing deployment. Investing in advanced grid deployments is the foundation of making community resilience a reality. We have recently prepared a briefing that illustrates the benefit from advanced grid deployments ranging from smart grid investments that have brought over $2 billion of added impacts in one wider community to single grid hardening projects that have decreased outages by 10% or more. I'd like to briefly highlight a couple of quick examples as I know my time is running low. Last week, the CEO of PG&E in California talked about how advanced grid capabilities allowed them to pinpoint high-risk areas that could have prevented 96% of the structures that were damaged or lost from previous wildfires. The DOE's own smart grid investment grants from 2009 to 2013 directly brought nearly $8 billion of resources to advanced grid capabilities. Many utilities accelerated their grid modernization plans by as much as a decade. One utility in your home state, Chair Cinema, is working with two military facilities to deploy hardened grid infrastructure, including microgrids, that will significantly increase the reliability of their operations. In a neighboring state to yours, Ranking Member Lankford, smart grid deployments helped lower outage time from one recent storm by an estimated 45 million outage minutes. And my utility here in Oregon is leveraging a portfolio of demand side distributed assets and market resources alongside grid modernization capabilities to help meet the needs like on that 115 degree day this summer where neither I nor very many customers were out of power. In summary, our electric grid is becoming more complex and so are its challenges. Resilience is no longer a matter of just energy supply. Instead, we must consider the capabilities of all grid connected resources and look beyond physical capacity. Central to harnessing these interconnected resources is access to and participation in wide markets that enable coordination and maximize their value, a topic I know we're gonna talk about today. However, technology, markets, and policy, or any factors alone will not solve this issue. We believe the bipartisan infrastructure package passed earlier this year through the Senate and the Energy Act of 2020 together provide an urgently needed down payment to advance much needed grid resiliency capabilities. It's critical that federal resources align with local realities to ensure that our grid can remain safe, reliable, and affordable. We must also prioritize and ensure that our grid is increasingly flexible, efficient, clean, equitable, secure, and as we are talking about today, resilient. Thank you for the time. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Yonker. Our third witness is Levi Esquera. Mr. Esquera is the Senior Vice President of Native American Advancement and Tribal Engagement for the University of Arizona. He has served as Tribal Chairman of the Chimawabi um, Indian Tribe and for three terms as their Tribal Council Member. Throughout his career, his focus has been on economic and community development for Arizona's Native Tribes. Welcome, Mr. Esquera. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Senator Sinema. Uh, this is a great opportunity and honor for me to be here today and to share a little bit of my thoughts. Uh, I've been at the University of Arizona for a little over a year. And the very first thing I wanna share with you is uh, my first interview with, uh, with President Robbins. He asked me, he said, hey, Levi, I'd like to work with the tribes. What can we do? And what I said to him, what I shared with him is, you know, that's a complex question, right? I mean, the answer, but I said, if you really wanna work with tribes, it takes three main things. You have to have patience. You have to have after patience comes respect. From respect comes trust. And I know what we're talking about today uh, impacts our tribal nations. In Arizona, we have 22 tribal nations. But throughout the United States, there's 570 plus. And I want to let you know that as I shared this with them, one of the things that I want to commend you, Senator Cinema, and everyone is when I start reviewing the Federal Permitted Reform and Jobs Act, there is a section in there that they're adding tribal and native corporation projects to be eligible for infrastructure projects. This allows tribes to have the same competitive access to funds that the states have historically benefited from. Kudos for you for doing that. That actually shows that you're actually making progress to not only listening to the tribes, but giving them an equal playing field. 
And I want to I want to commend you on that because that's not always done. But in saying that, and after listening to some of the comments, I'm deviating from my written testimony just to talk to you a little bit. I have found that one of the biggest struggles I've had in working with my tribal nation, Chemwebi and others, is sometimes we need to raise our capacity. We might have the desire to do a renewable energy project, but the capacity and the regulations that we have to go through sometimes is time consuming is beyond our capacity. So not only is there a need, we just opened up the opportunity for tribes to compete with states, right? States have been doing it for years. Tribes, this is gonna be their first go around doing it. We need to raise the capacity, not only of the tribes themselves, but those federal agencies who are gonna interact with the tribes. So they can see them for the uniqueness that they are, but the opportunities that are in front of them. Secondly, and I think even equally more important than that, is we need to understand within the federal agency, I know there was some talk about interacting and working together. I know we're talking about energy today, but there was a water structure that was done and Bureau of Reclamation took the lead on it, but they work with IHS, Indian Health Service, they work with USDA, they work with four different other components, state agencies as well, to deliver water to a chapter within Navajo Nation. Each of them had a different component that they could fund. They couldn't fund the whole project entirely, but they each took different components of it. And as they worked together, you saw a synergy take place and the project was able to get completed. Very rarely do I ever see synergy take place between multiple agencies working together, whether it's the federal government, the state government, or even with the tribal communities themselves. I think that is a huge component of this. We need to raise the capacity, but more importantly than that, those assets that are out there, how can we communicate and work efficiently together? In closing, I wanna tell you this. I know they have two minutes and I'll deviate it. Sorry, Senator Cinema, but I'm just, I'm just talking now, so I hope it's okay. I had, a, I had a dean at NAU, his name was Craig Van Slyke. His first day he came in, I met with him and he was from St. Louis and he was eager to engage. About a week later, I had the Hopi tribe. We were talking, we were developing and I asked uh, Dean Van Slyke to actually come in and do a welcoming. He said he was busy, he couldn't, so he sent the associate dean. The associate dean came in and said, Hey, it's great to have you here, Hopi. Any questions, follow with Levi and walked out the door. After about five hours, we were concluding our discussion. The dean popped his head in and saw us and got really excited and says, all right, jumped in, did introductions, talked for 30 or 40 minutes. Then he left and I had a good friend from Hopi invited me to their dances. His name was Cliff. I said, hey, I, I can't make it to it, but what about the dean? Do you think he would go? I said, let's go ask the dean. I asked him, he said, oh, that's a great honor. Two or three days later, Cliff came back to NAU, Northern Arizona University. He drew a map and said, this is where my, my, my sister's house is and she'll be expecting you. Went over some of the do's and don'ts. Don't take your camera, you know, where, where you need to be. Don't look at certain things. About two weeks later, I was engaging with, uh, with Dean Van Slyke and I said, how did it go? He looked perplexed to me. And I said, uh oh, something must've happened. He said, Levi, I want you to know, I took this job to help students be successful. I don't know nothing about the Hopi tribe. I don't know anything about the, the other tribes here in Arizona. How can I help them be successful if I don't know who they are? I define success, not making an A in, in a class or graduating from college. I define success as reaching your true potential. I know you have a consultation policy with Department of Interior and others. That is a key component to really helping tribes reach their true potential and their success. And I think resilience is, is, is a, is a natural with the tribes because we've been resilient since time immemorial. And with that, I say thank you and Topeak. Thank you, Ms. Esqueda. Um, Ranking Member Langford, would you like to introduce our fourth and fifth witnesses? I would be glad to. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, long, long hesitation, a little technical uh, jump there as well again. So, so to uh, Mr. Nickel and then uh, Mr. Bryce, of the order that you'd like to go and share. So let me, uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Lanny Nickel. Uh, he's the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Southwest Power Pool, uh, which is actually the power area that covers my home state in Oklahoma. He's, uh, he is responsible for uh, the provision of engineering, operations, information technology services, to members and customers. 
Uh, he began his career in planning and engineering for the uh, public service company of Oklahoma, joined Southwest Power Pool in 1997 as an operations engineer, where he helped establish Southwest Power Pool's reliability coordination and tariff administrative functions, promoted the management team in 1998, and uh, became vice president of operations in 2008, vice president of engineering in 2011, senior vice president of engineering in 2019. And I can't imagine a more fun job than to be in the leadership of Southwest Power Pool last February uh, when we were dealing with very difficult times. So grateful that you are here uh, to be able to walk through this. We look forward to your testimony. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Ranking Member Langford, and thank you uh, to Chair Cinema uh, as well as Ranking Member Langford and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to participate in this very important hearing. Uh, as as uh, Ranking Member Langford mentioned, I am the Chief Operating Officer of Southwest Power Pool. Uh, Southwest Power Pool, or SPP, as we are often referred to, is responsible for assuring affordable and reliable delivery of wholesale electric power across our 14 state region in the central part of the United States. SPP relies on a diverse portfolio of generating resources, a well-functioning wholesale energy market operated across a broad multi-state footprint and a robust electric transmission system to reliably deliver electricity to our utilities at the lowest possible cost. We very much understand and appreciate the critical role energy infrastructure plays in assuring our nation's safety, security, and vibrant economy. I can also assure you we understand it even better after our experience with this year's Winter Storm Uri. Winter Storm Uri was severe, particularly in our part of the country where many locations experienced record low temperatures. The extreme cold caused record amounts of wintertime electricity consumption in our region. That consumption would have been even higher and would have exceeded our previous winter record by more than 8% on Tuesday, February 16th, if we had been able to access sufficient energy supply. Unfortunately, only 42% of our generating capacity was available at this time which was 37% lower than what we expect to have during peak consumption periods. While nearly all types of generation struggled to perform at expected capabilities, gas generation was most impacted with 57% of its expected capacity being unavailable. Nearly half of this unavailability was attributed to lack of fuel. Despite our best efforts and as a last resort, we were required to interrupt electric service twice for a total of nearly four hours across two days with the maximum amount of service interrupted representing six and a half percent of our regional energy demand at the time. We very much appreciated and benefited from the tremendous amount of energy we received during this time from neighboring regions. This was enabled by our strong relationships and even stronger electric transmission interconnections. At times, nearly 14% of SPP's consumption was supplied from external parties through those interconnections. To put that in perspective, ERCOT's total interconnection capacity would have allowed no more than 1.5% of its energy needs to be supplied externally during this event we would have had to interrupt much more service for longer periods of time without the assistance that we received from our neighbors. I believe there are three key opportunities to improve energy infrastructure that will best mitigate the potentially disastrous results of these extreme events. First, we need to better assure access to an adequate amount of generating facilities that we can count on when they're most needed. At a minimum, we must know more accurately what we can count on in order to be better informed of the reliability value provided by those resources. Second, additional investments in the gas industry are needed to more reliably produce and deliver fuel to generators during these conditions. It's also imperative that decision makers better understand the relationship 
between the gas and electric industries and how those industries impact each other. Third, a strong electric transmission grid provides significant value during these types of events because it enables access to a much larger portfolio of generation and provides increased resilience. SPP realized this value firsthand. To better inform transmission investment decisions, we must include extreme scenarios in our planning assessments and better recognize the value of increased resilience. In conclusion, I know the cost of increased energy infrastructure needed to adequately ensure our nation's future can be expensive, but not having this form of adequate insurance when catastrophe strikes is likely to be much more costly. Thanks again for the opportunity. I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Nichol, thank you very much for that. I appreciate your testimony today. Uh, let me next introduce our last uh, witness, and that is Robert Bryce. Robert Bryce is an author, journalist, film producer, and podcaster. Been writing about energy, power, and innovation, and politics for more than three decades. Uh, he is the acclaimed author of six books, including most recently, A Question of Power, Electricity, and the Wealth of Nations. He also is uh, featured as the host of the Power Hungry podcast. Mr. Bryce. You're, uh, we're ready to receive your testimony. Great. Many thanks. Um, good afternoon to you, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Senator Lankford, I'm a native Oklahoman, so it's a pleasure to, uh, to speak in front of this committee. In fact, I've been in Oklahoma looking at energy infrastructure here over the last few days, and over the last five years have been all over the world, in fact, looking at the world through the lens of electricity. Um, and uh, including uh, a new documentary that I've produced called Juice, How Electricity Explains the World. My point today is, is to focus on the electric grid. America's electric grid is our most critical piece of energy infrastructure. The grid is the mother network, the network upon which all of our critical systems depend. But the affordability, reliability, and resilience of our electric grid are being undermined. Over the past few years, the fragility of our grid and its vulnerability to cyber attacks, physical attacks, and extreme weather events has become ever more obvious. I understand this vulnerability firsthand. In February, my wife Lauren and I were blacked out in central Austin for 45 hours during winter storm Uri. Between 2000 and 2020, the number of what the DOE calls major electric disturbances and unusual occurrences on our grid jumped nearly 13 fold. Sales of standby generators made by companies like Generac, Kohler, Caterpillar, and others are soaring. Our grid is being fragilized by three things. First is the increasing reliance on weather dependent and intermittent renewables like wind and solar. In August, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation identified changing resource mix as the most urgent challenge facing the electric grid. It also said our generation capacity is, I quote, increasingly characterized as one that is sensitive to extreme widespread and long duration temperatures as well as wind and solar droughts. The prolonged wind drought is one of the reasons why Britain and much of Europe is in an energy crisis today. In March, at a Senate Energy uh, at a Senate Environment and Public Works Committee hearing, XL CEO XL Energy CEO Ben Falk said, "I'm quoting: At higher levels of intermittent renewables, the cost of the energy system begins to skyrocket, and its reliability degrades." The second factor: dozens of coal-fired power plants, as well as several nuclear plants which provide resilient baseload power and help keep the grid stable, have been prematurely shuttered. The closure of those plants has made the grid more reliable, re, more reliant on just-in-time delivery of natural gas. I'm pro-natural gas, but since Enron declared bankruptcy 20 years ago, the amount of gas burned for power generation has more than doubled. Finally, regional transmission organizations like ERCOT in Texas and CAISO in California are not providing enough incentives to assure the reliability and resilience of the, of the electric grid. So what must be done? First, Congress must prevent the closure, should do all it can to prevent the closure of more coal and nuclear plants until regulators can be certain that their closures will not reduce the reliability and resilience of the grid. Second, the federal tax incentives for wind and solar energy, the PTC and the ITC, which are costing taxpayers billions of dollars per year, must be eliminated. These subsidies distort wholesale power markets, make the grid more reliant on the weather, and undermine the financial viability of the thermal power plants that are essential for grid reliability. For years, 
renewable energy advocates have claimed wind and solar are the cheapest option. It's high time for them to prove it. Third, Congress, along with federal regulators, should develop rules that incentivize on-site fuel storage at power plants. The blackouts in Texas that I lived through showed that the most reliable power plants during the blizzard were the ones that had on-site fuel, including the coal and nuclear plants. Federal incentives don't have to be limited, though, to coal and nuclear. They can also include fuel oil, which can be used in quick-start combustion turbines or in large reciprocating engines. Power plants with on-site fuel are absolutely essential for system resilience. If a regional grid fails, the grid operator must perform a black start to re-energize the grid. Those black start generation units must have on-site fuel. And in the post-mortem of the ERCOT blackouts, it was clear that those black start units were not ready, and many of them did not have enough fuel. Fourth, Congress must act to stop the closure of existing nuclear plants, including the scheduled closure of the Diablo Canyon plant in California beginning in 2024. The closure of our existing fleet, including the April closure of the Indian Point nuclear plant in New York, was a travesty. Congress must also work to accelerate the licensing and deployment of small modular reactors, which will bolster, bolster resilience and help with decarbonization. In conclusion, for too long, policymakers have ignored the fragility of our electric grid. The grid is our biggest, most complex, and most important piece of energy infrastructure. We take it for granted at our extreme peril. We cannot allow our electric grid to fail. Earlier this year, the writer Emmett Penny had it right when he said, there's no such thing as a wealthy society with a weak electric grid. We cannot afford to have a weak electric grid. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bryce. Now we'll begin the question portion of the hearing. Each member of the committee will have seven minutes and I recognize myself for those first seven minutes. Mr. Hergon, as you heard in Mr. Esquera's testimony, Arizona tribes have faced hurdles they could not overcome when attempting to enter into power purchase agreements to develop renewable energy and improve economic opportunity. What steps can we take with permitting and related issues to make sure that tribes have ample opportunity to engage in energy production activities? Uh, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's important to realize that tribal sovereignty also means tribal energy independence. And the current structure and the way in which the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other federal gatekeepers um, regulate and give permission to tribes, whether they be a direct service tribe or <clears throat> or, or a more independent larger tribe like the Navajo or, or the Hopi or the Ute tribe in Utah, um, oftentimes makes it more difficult for them to be able to harness the opportunities for new investment. And as my good friend Le Levi, or Levi pointed out, who I've spent a good amount of time with in Arizona, it's the institutional capacities on how to actually formulate a purchase power agreement. How do you not, how are you not perceived to be steamrolled um, by, by developers that are moving through are uh, moving through tribal areas. So it's important that we recognize that that um, that giving tribal sovereign nations the ability to develop their own energy is something we should have been doing months ago, not waiting six months for BIA to give that tribe permission. Thank you. And Mr. Esquera, while developing the federal permitting reform and jobs act with Senator Portman, I wanted to make sure that we were deliberate in our efforts to protect tribal interests. We accomplished this in two ways. First, we required that the permitting council produce annual best practices for effective coordination with tribal stakeholders. Second, we made sure that information provided by tribes would remain confidential and would not be subject to FOIA to preserve sacred, cultural, and historic sites. In your testimony, you noted that engaging with Native tribes from patience comes respect, and after you have respect, trust will surely follow. For too long, Native tribes in Arizona and across the country have not been treated as partners. So what impact will the permitting council reforms have on building respect and trust? And what additional steps should the federal government take on this front? You're actually, oh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Uh, as I said, uh, in my testimony, just having tribes to uh, have the same competitive access to funds as a state, I think, is a is a great step in the right direction. I think the other thing that's really, really key that needs to be done is. As you take time to listen and learn from the tribes and whatever is in your capacity, you can go back. A lot of times tribes, you know, we're talking about. 
electrify and renewable energy project. I bet you every tribe here in the state has plans, but it's always been the failed implementation of how to get that done. And I think that's what your question goes to. And I think the one thing is, is building that capacity. The other thing is working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to increase their capacity as well. Especially if you're talking about leasing lands, they have to do fair market value to, for the lease. And how do you de determine fair market value or future market values when it comes to place? But I am just thrilled by just the changes that you've made uh, that you're proposing in this legislation, because that truly opens up the door for tribes to have the same opportunities that states have. But more importantly, I think that goes to building that that relationship of trust. A lot of tribes feel like there's been mistrust throughout, you know, throughout throughout our history with the United States. This is the direction that takes you in a different because you're at, you're, you're actually saying, hey, you have the same opportunity as states, and we're going to treat you as the same. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Yonker, it's clear from your testimony and from the data available uh, that the threats causing grid disruptions are becoming more frequent and their effects are more severe. We've seen this in Arizona with the effects of both wildfire and extreme heat. Can you provide examples of actions that states, the federal government, or energy providers have taken to address these threats? Absolutely. Thanks for the question. So first, I'd start with the basics, ensure that there's robust vegetation management, critical infrastructure is being refreshed and maintained and basic monitoring is in place. Second, you start with a comprehensive planning in place that's beyond just grid. So it gets into other critical infrastructure, public safety, health and others. And then third, you've got to get into the actual deployments and you can precisely target them, real time sensoring, grid analytics and, and other capabilities. But let me give a couple examples. Um, in Washington State, Governor Inslee has created a clean energy fund that helps uh, provide tens of millions of dollars to annually support grid operators in deploying advanced capabilities. And in their last legislative cycle, they set aside $125 million specifically for forest restoration and community resiliency. Another quick example, BPA, a federal agency, has developed an annual wildfire assessment plan. And this year they had to put it in action when there was wildfires raging in Southern Oregon, and it helped them continue to keep operations of their transmission infrastructure going. Third, and very quickly, the national labs in California are testing a very novel concept that would de-energize a line in under a second before it hits the ground. So think about the real-time analysis that's needed to do that. And this is at the core of a lot of the federal investments that are being made. Thank you. Um, I understand uh, that Senator, actually, I have, I think I have time for one more quick question. So I'm going to go quickly um, to Mr. Yonker. In um, your testimony, again, a follow-up question for you. You laid out four keys to improving and maintaining grid resilience, flexibility, reliability, affordability. And I'm interested in exploring one of these in more detail, demand response. This is about keeping customer demand and electricity supply in balance. Arizona Public Services is a leader in implementing this system, and that's important as our energy mix and grid technologies continue to evolve. So can you tell us what role demand response plays in managing peak energy demand and reducing strain on the grid, and how does it complement renewable and peaking generation assets? Great question. So demand side management is leveraging the flexibility that customers have to bring value on the overall grid system. And customers benefit. They get incentives. They get to be a part of the solution, and it also helps them keep their rates low. Um, a commonly used form of demand response, for example, could be leveraging smart thermostats. So in this way, an aggregator or grid operator is going to send a signal to a smart thermostat and the customers are gonna respond. But let me give you a couple other examples. There's nearly 200 gigawatts of flexibility from both traditional and more tech-enabled demand response that could reduce peak load by 20%, it's estimated, and save over $16 billion annually. There's a company in California called OhmConnect. They are working towards building out 550 megawatts of a virtual power plant that they say could cut half of what was needed for the 2020 blackouts. They have 150 megawatts now. Um, and my utility here in Oregon is leveraging a portfolio of demand side and distributed assets. Um, this in, mu in many ways, like I said in my testimony, uh, is what helped them mitigate the impacts of the outages from that 115 degree day. But what I'd like to emphasize is that they just filed a plan for 2030 where they think they can get 25% of their power needed for the hottest and coldest days from that demand flexibility and from aggregating distributed resources. So it can be a very central role in running a modern grid. 
Thank you. I see my time's expired. Um, I understand Senator Lankford wants to defer his question to the end. So with that, I will turn to Senator Carper for his seven minutes. Senator Carper, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank the ranking member for deferring his questions to the end. It's very kind, James. Thank you. Uh, to our five witnesses, uh, welcome one and all. I look forward to the time we can actually do this together. And we can thank you in person. Uh, I, I want to start with my, my first question, if I could, with respect to electricity uh, grid resilience, uh, uh, with uh, directing that to, to you, Mr. Yonker. Did you feel up to it? All right, good. I, uh, the, uh, as we all know, the climate change is affecting just about every aspect of the electric grid uh, in all parts of our country from uh, generation, including transmission, uh, distribution, to, uh, to also include demand for electricity. The electricity sector currently accounts, I'm told, for about 27% of total uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. About another 25% is from uh, power plants. Another almost 22 23% comes from industrial operations. Think of cement uh, plants, for example. But uh, uh, as we saw with, uh, with the uh, Texas power grid failure, people too often try to blame uh, renewables for not performing during an extreme weather event. But uh, the, the real truth is that all, all energy uh, sources, and that includes natural gas, includes coal and, uh, and wind, are vulnerable if not properly weatherized or made uh, resilient for catastrophic uh, climate events. My question, uh, Mr. Yonker, would, would be this. Uh, do you agree that wind turbines and other sources of renewable energy can generate the power in cold weather without problems if the proper resiliency measures are taken. And clean energy does not necessarily mean unreliable energy. I want to take a, a shot at that. I, I agree that clean energy does not necessarily mean reliable energy. I, I think, like I said in my advanced forecasting remarks, the com computational power is letting us have a new wave of capabilities to forecast and almost dispatch these variable resources. And when you pair them with additional assets, like a battery that give you multiple hours of flexibility, it, it, it becomes in many ways with expectations for, you know, short term forecasts, uh, you know, a much higher capacity resource. So I agree with that. All right, good. Uh, just a, a follow up question. Do you agree that if resiliency measures are that adequately account for the impact of climate change are not taking every Every source of energy can be vulnerable to extreme weather events, uh, like the crisis we saw and we've just been talking about here uh, in Texas earlier this year. Texas was, Texas, sorry for the interruption. Texas was not the failure of a single uh, generation supply. It was a uh, failure of advanced planning for an extreme event, and so it had cascading failures. So yes, I agree. All right, thank you. Uh, one more question uh, for you, and then I'll pick on the other uh, members of our panel. But uh, with respect to modernizing the, uh, the electric grid, uh, critical energy infrastructure includes both physical and, and cyber infrastructure. Uh, it includes uh, pipelines, it includes uh, energy generation sites, uh, as well as technology uh, systems and software that help to keep our energy systems up and, up and running. Uh, the, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which the Senate passed uh, uh, by a 69 to 30 bipartisan vote, on August 10th, a happy day in my life. I think a happy day in most of our lives. But anyway, that, uh, that bipartisan vote on August 10th includes funding to help improve the resiliency of our nation's critical uh, infrastructure. Uh, specifically, there's, I think in the, in the legislation, there's more than 47 billion in new funding for critical infrastructure resiliency programs, including cybersecurity, including uh, cybersecurity efforts, including weatherization, wildfires, uh, flood mitigation and, and additional uh, funding also for a uh, grid modernization all in all in that bill which uh, a couple of my colleagues on here said especially as uh, senators sent them out a lot to, to do with the the crafting the uh, the question i'd have in addition to making electric uh, grid uh, investments which uh, we have which we know have been inadequately funded what can we do what can we do as lawmakers to support advanced uh, grid modernization activities. Well, I know you want me to be quick, so I won't recap with everything that you mentioned is in the package. Hopefully we can talk more about it. We are very supportive of it. I'm gonna mention the title 
of eight things we think there could be additional support for that we that we noticed weren't okay. quite as supported in the bipartisan packages we saw. Grid modernization and flexibility. It's in there some. It's a huge issue. There needs to be more of it. Let's appropriate the Energy Act of 2020. The RDND in that is critical, and only very small bits and pieces of it have been fully appropriated. As you'd mentioned, cyber, cyber was only 600 million. That's not enough for what we need to do to keep the frontier of our cyber, cyber capabilities leading class. Demand side management, as we had talked about with Chair Cinema, was not funded. That is a key building block. We need to get some support behind that. Wildfire mitigation and grid resiliency were somewhat focused on. Let's do more. Workforce development, we did not see for advanced grid capabilities. Let's get more innovations, long duration storage, microgrid, DER optimization, and then lastly, energy transition for local support. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all those uh, those results. That was great. Covered a lot in a very short period of time. You, you could do this for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is uh, for Mr. I, I want to make sure I pronounce uh, the, the name, Mr. Is it Paragot? Paragot? Yes, Senator. Okay, okay, thank you. Is, it, is your name ever been mispronounced? Uh, the last hearing I was in front of you, I think I pronounced it incorrectly in front of you. Uh, you correct. <laughs> I recall that. Good to see you again. Um, in uh, in uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the the challenge of staffing and funding shortfalls at uh, permitting uh, agencies, which contributes to project delay. Um, the last time that the Council on Environmental Quality assessed agency capacity for environmental reviews, it, it found that more resources were needed at these agencies in order to improve uh, review times. Uh, my question would be, uh, would you agree that it, it makes sense to increase agency capacity to improve efficiency and address this uh, longstanding problem? That would be the first half of my question. Uh, second half, would, would you uh, support uh, greater federal funding to permitting agencies, for example, like the Bureau of Land Management in order to complete environmental reviews and, and public participation. So it's a two-part question, if you would. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the first unfortunate reality is, is uh, uh, the younger generation is not graduated from college with biology and engineering degrees and in a rush to go work for the, the BLM, the Forest Service, or become a biologist at the, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is why we have 100 vacancies currently at BLM for project managers. So you have one regulator that has a $2 billion project that must review a thousand page application and that slows down the process. So yes, funding is an issue, but it's also the reality that we have to right size the way in which we move applications through the federal government because it's a black box and sometimes we forget there's a 29 year old biologist that must review a $4 billion transmission line and then we complain when there are delays. Um, so that's, that's the important part. I also think that we have to be very careful about deemed approved and hard deadlines on, on project approvals, because what is occurring is front loading the process and this opaque informal process on the front end, which puts a lot of stress on, on individuals at the Forest Service, Department of Interior, to deem an application before, before the clock starts in FIPSI and one federal decision and all these accountability tools start to work. And there's no real guidance or education or training, both on the project developer side and the disconnect between the regulators when they don't talk uh, the fact that projects actually work is 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 an exception, not the rule. So, um, um, short answer, yes. All right, I like that short answer. Thank you uh, very very much. Good to see you again. Thanks for your help. Yeah. I'm Chair. Thanks. Thanks so much, Senator That's, Harper. Uh, Senator uh, I I believe Senator Portman's still voting, so we'll move to Senator Padilla next. Senator Padilla, you're recognized for seven minutes. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of uh, questions that are in some ways follow-ups to items that have been raised earlier. Uh, but to set the stage, uh, last year, the Department of Energy found that weather-related power outages have increased by 67% since the year 2000. Now, across the country, extreme weather events are increasing in both severity and frequency. I think we all recognize that. And that has uh, significantly strained uh, electrical grids, uh, whether it's extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, and everything in between. Now, these events erode public confidence in the grid and leave vulnerable populations in the dark for days, literally. Uh, like many states, California continues to see an increase in extreme weather events that have prompted outages and power shutoffs. Uh, that's why I was proud to uh, partner with Senator Cornyn uh, to introduce our Power On Act, uh, 
uh, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that passed uh, the Senate in August. While this bill is just a start, it provides critical funding for utilities and states to upgrade and modernize their grid infrastructure uh, to better withstand extreme weather and increase the overall reliability of the grid. Uh, Mr. Yonkers, as you noted, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, is uh, uh, going to be important with, through the resources it provides for uh, grid stability and resiliency. Uh, can you uh, just expand on that by sharing uh, maybe what some of the risks are uh, and potential future impacts if we do not begin to evaluate the strength and reliability of our grid through the lens of resiliency, not just reliability, but resiliency. Yeah, I, I think the start of the of the package section 40101 for those who know the details to get into resiliency, those billions of dollars uh, couldn't be more needed from utilities, states and 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 other locations, especially some of the fo funding that's focused for smaller communities and more rural communities. Uh, to answer your question on what will happen if we don't fund this adequately, we can expect uh, higher outages. Um, there was a Washington Post article that that uh, described doubled outage time in the last five years. Um, this could continue if we don't invest in our grid and, and, and have it be resilient. Certainly lost productivity. The chair mentioned the $9,000, nearly $9,000 a minute impact for data centers. Uh, I saw that that article also cost uh, large manufacturers a uh, million dollars an hour and large retailers uh, $5 million a day. Um, and as we've been talking about the loss of life, this last nine months has been hugely impactful. Hundreds, if not thousands of people have, have been directly impacted from the, the, the severe weather events. So heat impacts, fire impacts, wind, water, ice. These are things that are gonna be stressing our grid. We need to be proactive in investing in them. And uh, one more minute on uh, the cybersecurity concerns that you raised earlier and this part of the same package. Absolutely. So the subtitle on cybersecurity is fantastic. It, from what we have seen, we haven't noticed cyber funded uh, for about a decade from package energy legislation. Is $600 million enough? I would argue no. Um, cyber considerations have to be in anything. We saw a study from Siemens a year and a half ago that said 56% of energy operators have experienced a data breach. Um, and I'm just going to quote really quickly from the GAO electric grid cybersecurity report. I quote, they recommend that DOE develop a plan that addresses the key characteristics of a national grid strategy, including a full assessment of cybersecurity risks. DOE agreed to that and they're working on it. It has to be central to the investments that we make on our system. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for uh, your testimony. Uh, one more uh, question, this one for Mr. Herrigott. As noted by uh, you and others, many of the renewable energy projects needed to meet our greenhouse gas emission targets remain in various stages of planning and development. So as we work to combat the uh, climate crisis and transition to a green economy, uh, we must also work together to ensure that the permitting process for clean renewable energy projects is streamlined while also maintaining important environmental protections. Uh, can you discuss the importance of making the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council permanent and how the council could help meet the streamline uh, uh, of permitting uh, and climate goals? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it, 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 at the outset, it's important to point out that more than 99% of all new wind, solar, um, energy storage, and carbon capture are entirely supported by the private sector, unlike roads and bridges. Um, and they're not going to move forward and invest capital that will, will start a two to three year planning and, uh, and pre-engineering phase before they get to the two to six year for transmission lines environmental phase. And then the two years, especially with cash strap supply chains, two years to acquire all the materials, then two years to build, which is how we get to 10 years unless they have the long-term reliability because we've already had two or three transmission lines in the last year where utilities and companies just walked away. Um, and so the Federal Permitting Council making that permanent gives the long-term certainty to uh, U.S. companies foreign uh, as well to invest in these multi-billion dollar projects. So although we're looking at micro and new technologies, that is to retrofit a program, a, a, an energy grid that is about 80% less than what it should be now, and we should be pulling in new technologies by incentivizing with predictability through a process where we can start to 
dial down on the, on, on the time it takes to advance renewable energy because they're missing out on franchise agreements and the ability to actually provide a, a reliable source of new energy um, to off takers in towns and cities across, across the country. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Padilla. Um, I think uh, Senator Portman may not be back yet from voting. So, um, Senator Lankford, I'll turn it to you to start your first round of questioning. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me go through uh, quite a few questions because I'm going to kind of drill down on, on several issues that are here. But, uh, Mr. Nickel, I want to begin with you. Uh, obviously, the issue of diversity of fuel sources has come up several times. Try to figure out how do we make sure that we have a diversity of fuel sources. So, if we have a problem with one, we have availability in others. We've had a lot of conversation about wind and solar. Uh, obviously, making those more resilient has been an issue. Uh, we can make those more resilient, but they're always going to be intermittent. There will be long periods of time, especially in the central part of the United States, where we'll have days without a lot of sun. And uh, we'll have days that will have less uh, wind as they're experiencing right now across Europe and U in UK, uh, causing some of those issues there. So let's talk a little bit about diversity of fuel sources. What do we need? How do we know when we overproduced or we're over reliant on some sources that are more intermittent? Well, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Langford, for that question. It um, it's it's an important question, um, and, and I think the observation is is very real and and accurate. Diversity of resources is very helpful. Um, none of us would invest in a single stock and plan on that stock to be our retirement plan. And I think the same thing can be said of generating resources. The more diversity we have the more we can count on being able to deal with any number of different events. Uh, this, this winter, uh, we were able to count on all of our diverse resources. Gas, coal, wind, hydro, nuclear, it all produced. And to some extent, a lot of it produced at a much lower degree than what we had hoped and expected based on our studies. That's the real issue. The real issue is not whether we need less diversity or more diversity. What we need is to be able to better understand how that diverse portfolio of resources is expected to operate during these varying conditions, whether it be wintertime conditions, summertime conditions, fall or spring. That's our job, and that's what we need to do a better job of going forward is better understanding what to expect from that diverse portfolio of resources. Let me drill down on a couple of things on that. One is, uh, you, you had mentioned before, interconnectivity, obviously, with other regional uh, transmission groups. So, you, you stated for Southwest Power Pool, there was enough interconnectivity there. Uh, so, I have two sets of questions there. Is that true for the other RTOs, that they have enough interconnectivity? Uh, we obviously had four hours, as you mentioned, of time that was downtime. Uh, so it was clear we weren't able to take in enough during those time periods or the other RTOs were not able to no be notified fast enough to be able to get it over. Obviously, Texas has a different issue uh, there with it. So the, the two sides of this, one is where does that strengthen us to have more connections or do we have enough connections? And the second part is where does that make us more vulnerable to have more connections with other RTOs? Well, as I stated in my testimony, uh, we were very blessed and uh, and um, we realized a lot of value by the virtue of having the interconnected capability we did with our neighbors. Now, we SPP is a region that operates in the what is referred to as the Eastern interconnection. The other interconnection is the Western interconnection. Uh, that's where Madam Chair um, receives her energy from utilities that operate in the Western interconnection. And then you have the majority of Texas that operates in an interconnection known as ERCOT. By virtue of being in the Eastern interconnection and by virtue of having tremendous interconnection capability with our neighbors, we were able to have access to hundreds of thousands of megawatts of generation to the extent it was available and to the extent the transmission system was able to deliver it. So just because you have interconnection capability doesn't mean you have transfer capacity. And that's what really helped is that we had enough transfer capacity to be able to import at times 6,000 megawatts. If that had been continuous throughout the entire seven day week, 
we would not have had to shed load. Unfortunately, there were a few times where the transmission system on an intervening system was just simply not able to deliver that power to us at the 6,000 megawatt area or, or level that we had been able to rely upon for most of the event. So without that capacity, we, we would have seen a lot worse of a situation. We would have had to shed a lot more load. It could have looked more like what ERCOT experienced if we hadn't had the benefit of interconnection capacity. Now, could we use more of it? Absolutely, but that has to be determined and assessed on a cost benefit basis. One of the things that we've got to do a better job of when we when we value the investment decisions that are being made and we're determining the benefits of those, we've got to do a better job of understanding the value of resiliency and, and the increased resiliency that is available and afforded to us by transmission expansion. I know this is going to be evaluated all based on costs and in my second round of questions, I'm going to have lots of questions for some of the other uh, folks that are here on the panel. So I appreciate your insight as well, but Mr. Nicola, I want to drill down on one other thing. There's been a lot of conversation about the natural gas side of things. When I talk to the natural gas folks, they'll say they were electricity power dependent that once they lost power and it rolled off for whatever reason for them, the wellheads froze, they weren't able to produce and they weren't able to send natural gas. Uh, then to, to do more electricity generation, which made the problem even worse, and it became this circular event uh, where when they lost power, then they lost uh, capacity to be able to send, and it became a bigger issue. One of the issues there is identifying those locations where if you have to be able to pull some spots offline, hospitals, for instance, nursing homes, that also that your wellheads and your places that are actually sending natural gas to your uh, generation would also be in that list. Is that in conversation right now? Where does that stand? It, well, Senator, it is in conversation right now, and, and um, we are really embarking on that learning exercise right now. And one of the things that I think has got to happen, we've got to do a better job of, and that is we got to communicate more. The gas industry, the electric industry has to get together at the table and talk, and we haven't done a good job of that in the past, and that's why you are hearing and other people have heard similar comments and similar explanations for why gas didn't perform. I know anecdotally, based on some of the things I've heard, that there is some evidence that that occurred. It's certainly not the whole story, and it's certainly not the primary cause of the gas failure in, in SPP. Nevertheless, the more we can talk, the more we communicate about how to work together more effectively, the, the better chance we have of resolving the issue, the right issue, and answering the right question with the right solutions. Yeah. What would you say is the primary cause on the gas failure there for SPP? In SPP, what we know is that there was a lack of fuel supply, and we believe, based on information that our market monitor has produced, is that it was a combination of two things. Gas just simply wasn't available and or gas prices were too high. Those were the two leading drivers of the gas unavailability. Again, having said that, I also know that there are situations and worse situations where gas wasn't available because its electric service was shut off. I mean, we do know that that happened. We just don't think that that was the largest contributor to their lack of availability. Sure, Sam, can I just stretch this into one more question there just to close the loop on this? Sure, of course. So the, the issue on the on the gas side is, is a really important issue in trying to be able to determine uh, dependency on this, where this goes. Uh, right now, I don't know what the standards are uh, for uh, any of those that are producing electricity on what amount of gas they're going to do by contract in advance, what they're going to purchase on spot price, and what they're going to do in storage uh, that they have on for a uh, quick capability on that. What's the typical formula? Now, I know in SPP, it's going to be different state to state and how that's handled, but the issue of how much gas is available on contract, what the price is going to be in spot, obviously, and as that floats from day to day, and what they've actually got on site uh, will matter and how much that they're able to use in those peak moments. What, what, what's the basic formula for those three? Well, I, I wish I could give you a better answer than what I'm about to give you, so let me just apologize in advance. SPP does not have any rules or criteria around how much of that gas should be purchased on a firm basis or on a non-firm basis, as you refer to on the spot. 
What we do expect is that if a gas fire generator is going to be counted as accredited capacity, that it does need to have firm fuel supply during the period of time that it wishes to be accredited. So, so it's kind of, um, if you want to be considered valuable, you must do this, but, but it's, it's really a choice that the, the generating utilities make regarding how they pursue that question. So the challenge becomes then, if you get into a crisis moment where everyone's trying to get more natural gas, the spot price dramatically increase, and we'll come back and talk about that later, uh, that becomes a pretty big issue. If you don't have enough storage uh, that's available to you and you're fighting with everyone else to be able to get access to other things, uh, you do have a critical gap that's there on very cold or very hot days. Uh, that what is your reliable power? That's not intermittent at that point. If your intermittent goes down, your reliable power is now not reliable just based on access to the source. Am I tracking that correctly? Yes, absolutely. And and you become much more exposed to really high gas prices, which is exactly what we saw in February and what drove a lot of our energy prices in our our market uh, to record high levels. Well, th this seems like a solvable issue in trying to be able to establish how much we're going to have to do on contract to have as a firm uh, commitment there to be able to come in uh, because natural gas is not something you can just turn on more of at an instant uh, and trying to figure out how to be able to get more out. And then it, if you have a snowball effect with everyone else is going after it, especially when Texas was so desperate at that point, uh, and so many people that were selling were selling south at that point, uh, it becomes a much bigger issue. Uh, Chair Sinema, thank you very much for the extra time there. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Senator Langford. I recognize Senator Portman for his seven minutes of questions. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you guys for great testimony today. I, in my opening statement, uh, talked about the permitting council. I want to get back to that in a minute. But first, I was interested in some of the things you said. Mr. Yonker, you talked a little bit about flexibility and adaptability of both the supply and demand uh, as being important to a resilient 21st century grid. As you know, perhaps the bipartisan infrastructure bill does include a number of provisions for energy efficiency, including some provisions from the uh, work I've done with Senator Shaheen over the years on uh, helping on efficiency, also weatherization for low income Americans. What role does energy efficiency play in tempering the demand side of this in terms of being sure we have a reliable grid and helping to support its overall operation and reliability? We don't weigh a whole lot into generation mix topics, but this is an exception to that rule. Absolutely cost effective energy efficiency resources de deployed first, they lower the bar. So if we have a, a peak need or we have a grid disturbance, it just makes it easier to deal with that. So efficiency being deployed at scale is a great place to start, is the place to start. And there's some really interesting overlap between automated energy efficiency and demand side management and DER integration that is really blurring those lines in smart buildings and other areas that, as you said, is is importantly supported in the in the package. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I do think it's an important part of the answer and it's bipartisan and it's something that, you know, is so great for the economy. It makes us more competitive globally to have more efficiency because they're lower costs and manufacturing is an example. Uh, so I, I appreciate your your uh, focus on that. Mr. Bryce, in your testimony, you state that policies to ban the use of natural gas and to, as you say, electrify everything are dangerous to the reliability of our electrical grid. You talk about uh, concerns about uh, uh, not having enough energy resources and, and diverse energy resources. This is, this is exactly what's going on in Ohio. In Ohio, we have a very diverse portfolio, but coal, coal and natural gas still provide more than 80% of our state's electricity. And uh, increasingly, it's natural gas, about 40%. Coal is about 45% now. Nuclear is about 13%. Renewables about 2.5%. Can you, Mr. Bryce, talk a little about the benefits of a diverse energy portfolio and how energy innovation in renewables, in storage technology, in advanced nuclear, in hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage technologies, how those uh, can really help to provide for a more stable grid and more energy affordability? Well, that's that's quite a laundry list there, Senator, but I will take a couple of cracks at it. Um, uh, first, to the issue of natural gas and uh, this push for electrify everything. I do indeed think it's a very, it's a, not just a bad policy, it's a dangerous one. And I speak from personal experience. Uh, during the February blackout in Austin, uh, my wife and I bought our house 21 years ago. One of the first things we did was plumb in natural gas. 
And so we were 45 hours without electricity, but we, we still had gas so we could cook. We had, we had hot water. Um, we could keep at least the kitchen warm by, by turning on the burners. Um, the idea that we would just rely solely on the electric grid for all of our energy needs, in, including hot water for cooking, et cetera, for heating, is just a bad idea. And unfortunately, we see in California, now more than 50 communities have banned the use of natural gas in new residential uh, construction and in oh. many commer commercials. Uh, it's also a regressive policy, Senator, that uh, the price of, of, of electricity on a per unit of energy basis is four times that of natural gas. Uh, this was in the, uh, an, uh, according to uh, uh, a notice in the Federal Register published by the Department of Energy earlier this year. So as far as the other issues that you mentioned, let me just touch on the nuclear because you did, you brought up a lot, a lot of uh, issues there. I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, sir. If, if we are serious and if the, if the Senate, if Congress, if we're going to be serious about decarbonization in the United States, we have to get deadly serious about nuclear energy. This is the fifth time I've, I've testified, testified before Congress. I've been consistent over the last 10 years in my testimony before Congress. If, if, if Congress is going to be serious about decarbonization, we need bipartisan long-term support for the development and deployment of new nuclear reactors, and we need, to, uh, reserve, we need to preserve and extend the lives of the existing reactors in our fleet. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And this new technology is safer, <laughs> uh, fewer issues with regard to the disposal challenge. And, uh, you know, the rest of the world is going to surpass us unless we catch up on, on that technology. Um, and if I could, and I could build on that, sir, it's clear that the Russians and the Chinese are the ones that are now leading internationally on the on the development and deployment of new nuclear. Yeah. Um, the French President Macron, just in the last few days, in response to the gas crisis in Europe, said the French are now going to be deploying uh, small modular reactors. The U.S. needs to get off the dime and move and move quickly. Yeah. And we also have an enrichment uh, challenge here in this country. We have only one place that's an American enrichment source and it's not commercialized yet uh, happens to be in Ohio. And uh, so that's the Portsmouth gaseous diffusion plant, which is now uh, changing into a centrifuge plant. But we need to get the commercial level of uh, uh, enriched uranium up so that we can have a, uh, an adequate uh, industry here in the United States. Um, how about hydrogen? And anybody else in the panel wants to talk about hydrogen? Um, derived from various sources, including, of course, fossil fuels, natural gas, as, as one example. We have a plant in Ohio that's doing that on a commercial scale. What's the potential there? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in really quickly, sir. I'm, I'm skeptical about hydrogen just uh, for several reasons. One is the amount of energy needed to produce the hydrogen molecule. Uh, I've done the math many times. It's roughly one and a half units of energy in for one unit of hydrogen out. Uh, then you have a molecule that's very difficult to handle, very difficult to store, and we don't have a lot of fuel cells sitting around in which we can use uh, we can use hydrogen. So um, I understand the discussions, but I, I've been hearing the same discussions about hydrogen now for 20 years. I, I'm yeah. happy to admit that I may be wrong, but uh, I, we've heard this for a long time. Anybody else in the panel want to talk about fuel cell technology and, and, and where you see it going, hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, Senator, I, I, I'd just like to point out that the market is dictating the profitability and the ability to de determine an ROI on new, on new energy sectors. That's why you're seeing all of the old legacy utilities that previously, whether it be a Duke Energy or Dominion, Dominion rebalance assets to try and figure out how they can, they can operationalize new sources of electricity to derive a rate payer, whether that be coal, natural gas, hydrogen, you name it. And so in many cases, the federal government doesn't have a role except to get out of the way and try and fix this. So that the 20 to 30 percent on that project development cost, which we have 800 billion dollars um, of sitting right on the sidelines, we can actually address the capacity issues rather than looking at efficiencies and microgrids as our only solution, which is triage to address the fact that we need to double our actual gigawatt output, regardless of where it comes from, 20 percent a year every year for the next 20 years to meet overall energy demand. So I don't think we're in a position to dictate to the private sector that funds most of this, um, what energy source they should choose and derive uh, and derive an ROI on. Alex, let's talk about the project development cost issue um, a little bit. Uh, we talked earlier uh, during my opening about the removal of the sunset on the FAST 41 provision, which enables us to have some more certainty and predictability going forward with regard to the council and ensuring that we are saving money on every single uh, project that is covered, including a lot of energy projects. 
as the former director of the Federal Permitting Improvement Council, um, and by the way, I appreciate your inviting me down to participate in some of those council meetings and listen to what goes on and, and you know, meet with the agency uh, leadership that is involved from dozens of uh, different parts of our, our government. It's been really interesting. But what can be done to improve the permitting council? How could it be even more effective? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the permitting council is not a magic bullet. Uh, it can't compel agencies to meet milestones and meet deadlines in a way in which it supersedes the, the 30 odd 60 permitting laws that have been passed over the last 100 years, whether there be the Endangered Species Act passed in the 70s, the Rivers and Harbors Act from 1910. FIPSI is a tool to coordinate federal agencies and ensure accountability. But at the end of the day, the agencies are self reporting, self selecting their permitting schedules. And what I worry about is there's a tremendous amount of front loading happening before FIPSI ever gets to provide those accountability protocols, which can now be as much as two to four years before an application is deemed complete. And that never makes it on to anyone's sheets. And when we're talking about NEPA or NEPA reviews or what this CEQ is doing, it's about the 60 other permits that happened before and then the land use permits that happen after that delay construction. And, and so I op there's only been 10 projects added to FIPSI this year. Uh, and I worry sometimes that the illusion of progress is no progress at all. And I get worried that that uh, it'll lessen the urgency for us to actually do the hard work because there'll be a mission accomplished that if we extend FIPSI um, in, 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 uh, in perpetuity that we've solved all the world's problems when in fact it is a small piece of the puzzle but an extremely necessary one to, to yeah. exhibit the best practices all agencies should, should incubate. Well, I, I said earlier, I, I appreciate your passion for this and your uh, consistent advocacy up here in the Hill and then at the council and now in your private sector role. Um, yeah, you, you talk about in your testimony, these formal or informal policies uh, to front load preliminary biological cultural historical surveys. Um, how do we bring more accountability to that process? Um, I, I think, first of all, it, it, it's the it's the idea that um, that many of the federal regulars don't actually really talk to each other. I mentioned uh, I mentioned uh, one of the projects where in the Department of Interior, three different agencies within don't talk to each other, nor do they actually understand each other's requirements. Um, and so there's this rush to meet a schedule without actually understanding that the folks putting these projects forward are not to be treated as adversaries, but rather customers. They're the same Americans that are building the broadband, the transmission, the natural gas. But for somewhere along the line, the process has gotten so complicated that even I don't understand the documents when they're 10,000 pages long and have another 10,000 pages of appendices. Attorneys should not be talking to attorneys. Scientists should be talking to a scientist. That's why my nonprofit, the nonpartisan group, is working with Christine Harada, who is the current acting executive or the executive director of the Federal Permitting Council. She's doing an amazing job, but she's only one person. She can't make the agencies, uh, she can't make the agencies care about um, accountability and efficiency as in meeting milestones. She's only one person. You have to have an activated executive branch and administration that is putting deputy secretaries as council members in a place to adjudicate disputes and clear out. Um, the communication breakdowns that happen amongst agencies. And I, I unfortunately, I'm not sure that's occurring. Do you think we have the right people currently sitting on the council? Uh, the statute requires members to be deputy secretary or higher, but it appears to me that a number of the members currently are not at that level. Does that ra raise uh, some practical problems in the Biden administration? I think the way in which President Obama and yourself and others, when they when when they were enacting the council, and then it was over the last four years as a truly nonpartisan entity. This is not a. Uh, this is not to inject politics uh, into the process. What all it requires is that somebody at the top end of the agency able to adjudicate disputes and clear out the disagreeing voices on a risk based decision on whether a project is a green light or a red light or what mitigation needs to occur. If you do not have that deputy secretary in that role. Then it hampers the council and in many cases it makes it ineffective. Yeah. So you think a more senior membership would be helpful moving forward? Uh, that statute, might be one recommendation. Senator, the statute says deputy secretaries for a reason. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, listen again. I appreciate uh, your work on this over the years, and um, Alex, let's let's keep in touch. And thanks for coming before the subcommittee today to give us your expertise and all the witnesses. Uh, we thank you for your help on the energy infrastructure challenges we face. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
uh, Senator Portman. I'm going to go to a second round of questions, first recognizing myself and then Senator Lankford for additional questions. So, Mr. Hergott, in your time as the Executive Director of the Federal Permitting Improvement Council, you were able to help over 50 projects reduce their permitting timelines while maintaining the same standards for approval. With the historic investment in our country's infrastructure in the bipartisan infrastructure package, how can the federal government leverage the permitting council and its coordination ability to ensure the timely use of these funds? Uh, th that's, a, that's a great question. And that's the crux of, of uh, the reason why we created this, this uh, permitting institute, which, which uh, complements what uh, executive director Harada and the administration are doing at the federal permitting council. However, the reason why only 10 projects have joined uh, FIPSI this year is many of the offshore wind projects, 70 billion worth, 13, 13, uh, 13 projects in total that have the ability to generate 150 base load electricity within six to seven years from now um, with, the, with, the appropriate, uh, with the appropriate energy storage capacities. Um, they are still awaiting in this construction operation management pre-planning before they even get to NEPA three years from now. And so, Casting transparency on the entire project development life cycle, which out, without a letting hyperbole from our flanks, uh, make it difficult to pick up the veil and actually look at why projects are not being constructed is why FIPSI uh, permanence is important because they play an integral role in bringing best practice and transparency to these systemic issues that continue to or that are continue to be ignored uh, and which continue to push new investment uh, on, on energy uh, further into the future. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's extremely important that we support them, that the administration supports them. We also have to take a hard look at the 60 other laws that, that are underlined within agencies or else uh, FIPSI is a fig leaf and a fig leaf uh, of, of a solution is no solution at all. Oh, thank you. Um, turning back to Mr. Esqueda, throughout your career promoting economic and community development for Arizona's tribes, you've noted the high number of federal requirements that are necessary to accomplish any economic development project. By granting tribes, Alaska Native corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations expanded access to the coordinating benefits overseen by the Permitting Council, how can Arizona tribes best access economic development opportunities that take advantage of this provision? Thank you for that question. As I previously said, I just think, you know, opening up the funds uh, to make it a level playing field with the states. I think the other thing people, uh, we need to really realize is, is the tribes, uh, their basic infrastructure, even when it comes to energy is, is we're far behind than what's, what's currently out there. You know, uh, there's been discussion of what happened in Texas. You know, the Wallapai tribe, when, when they have electricity go out, it's not for two or three hours, it's for two or three days at a time. That's the average norm because they only have one electrical line going in. And then the process of putting in a loop system, but they've been struggling, you know, going through the process. I think now they're in the month 32 or 33, trying to get a loop system in place just so they can offset some of the, the, the issues that, that happen when, when power goes out in that community. And that's nothing new with, with most of the tribal communities in Arizona. I think the biggest thing, like I said earlier, is building the capacity of the, of the tribes themselves, but also those federal agencies that when they engage with the tribes. It is so important for, to have that relationship. And, and I talked about how you can develop that relationship, but it just takes time and some patience. But truly, if you really wanna work with tribes, engage with tribes, it's that understanding of what makes them unique in their culture. Thank you. Thank you. Moving now to Mr. Yonker. Innovation is a critical component of strategic planning and preventing grid outages. Two of our Arizona utilities are undertaking this type of work. Salt River Project has started work to develop an integrated system plan, which will allow it to integrate new renewable and distributed resources and more effectively respond to changes in low growth with the growth of electric vehicles and electrification. And Tucson Electric Power has partnered with military facilities the Davis Monthan Air Force Base and the Fort Huachuca Army Base to reduce single grid points of failure and ensure critical load continuity with enhanced grid infrastructure. What state steps can we take to encourage these types of activities in other regions? Great question. Historically, electric grid operators have not been incentivized to innovate or try something that maybe doesn't work. Uh, so the rate of R&D investments by utilities versus basically all other industries is, is negligible. Um, I, 
I would say that a culture of accelerating innovation must become a core competency of electric grid operators as they move into the 21st century. So they shouldn't fear things like virtual power plants. They should be experimenting with real time monitoring and uh, real, you know, machine learning uh, applications to pinpoint uh, issues. Um, so a couple examples specifically, one's local, but federal support and signals could help. So the idea of a regulatory sandbox is a great way to put guardrails and restrictions to some extent as state regulators work in partnership with the utilities that they're regulating. Um, I'd even be more supportive of more aggressive ideas where utilities have upside potential if things go well while they're innovating. And you know maybe they even share those with some of their stakeholders, those benefits. Um, federally, competitive grants like those in the bipartisan package are at the core of making these solutions available where new innovations can be experimented and the risk or the opportunity to try something new can be shared amongst uh, other capabilities. And then DOE and the agencies and the partnerships that they have to commercialize is just central. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hergott, improving redundancy is an important part of creating an electrical grid capable of satisfying demand, especially as we continue to develop an all of the above energy strategy. How do we best harness our improvements to the permitting process to create a grid better able to function during extreme weather events and surging demand? Thank you. It's, it's important to note that, that more than 90% of all transmission lines across the country are, are close to 70 years old, right? Um, and when we talk about the capacity needs, um, they far outweigh the efficiency needs. The efficiency needs are the triage because we haven't had the investment in the actual transmission because there hasn't been the kind of off takers. But also we are in a new situation now where the wind, solar, and even the dual fire power plants that might be natural gas and coal are located in areas that were economically feasible, but now require a 300 mile connection to bring them to the place where the energy is actually needed. Uh, and there's a fundamental disconnect between federal regulators that have never actually built a project before and are, and are, are, are unaware in many cases of the financial development and legal risks that these companies are jumping off the cliff to, um, to provide for, for this country. So the reality here is, is the very Princeton study that Secretary Granholm brings up with 22 uh, transmission projects that are shovel ready. 12 of those are actually not shovel ready. They're, with their, they're in a standstill with no resolution in sight, but we keep talking about them being shovel ready. So it's very difficult to talk about redundancy and resiliency when we have close to $120 billion right now of projects that are both in active permitting that are at a standstill and are looking at potentially abandoning the project, one of big one in Arizona in particular, um, and, and, uh, and that's just something that we need to shine a light on because those folks are going away. They, there's, there has to be an incentive for people to put capital at risk to build energy assets. The government is not going to do it for them. Uh, and so the confluence of the Federal Permanent Council, your work in, in, the, in the bipartisan package on the grants, and then also actually give them the real help that they need is uh, by fixing the, the underlying complicated nature of all the 60 statutes that are inside and outside of NEPA are essential. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Thank you. Uh, my last question is uh, for Mr. Nickel. You know, extreme weather, including heat waves and record low temperatures, have strained regional electric grids across the country. And at the same time, the federal government is weighing investments in electric vehicles and conversions to electric heating. Now, these investments would increase the nation's electricity use at the same time that siting new transmission lines has proven challenging. With the need to increase grid capacity and reliability, and efficiently connect energy production with use, how can we upgrade and expand both our transmission and distribution grids across the country? Well, Madam Chair, I, um, what I would begin with is we, we have to make sure that we have willing investors. We have to make sure that we have an independent body or bodies that oversee the development, the approval, the regulatory approvals of the most effective and optimal projects. In SPP, uh, we, we are rich in a lot of resources. We have 94,000 megawatts of nameplate capacity to serve 51,000 megawatts of peak demand. What we have to do a better job of it making, is making sure that that capacity is deliverable and that it energizes and, and provides energy when it's needed the most. And then we have to have effective 
and optimal transmission assets that are needed to deliver that. A regional transmission organization, granted I'm partial to that. I'm, in, I'm a big fan of regional transmission organizations. Those are the kinds of organizations that can achieve the collaboration and the engagement of large groups of participants. They can do it in an independent way and make sure that, um, that the right and the most optimal transmission is provided and enabled. And we also don't have any advocacy or picking and choosing over resources. Those resources are developed by the utilities and they do that because they have customers that ask for those resources, whether it's wind, solar, whatever, it, they have customers that are driving those decisions and they have their own analyses that determine what's cost beneficial for them to invest in. Uh, but at, at the head of that, you really do need somebody that has independent oversight, making sure that the appropriate transmission infrastructure is also being built to facilitate the reliable delivery of those assets. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lankford, I'd like to recognize you for a second round of questions before we close out our hearing. You're recognized. Thank you very much. Strickland, I want to be able to follow up with one last question on this. There was a lot of conversation uh, on the price of natural gas during last February storm. Uh, you brought that up as well. Uh, so th there are a lot of market features that are there with supply, demand, the contract, the spot price, the, all of the storage as we talked about before. But I have a, an odd question for you that I hope there's an answer to. How did it get to that price, the final price that it got to for natural gas? Why was that the final price? Uh, Y'all were dealing with the different costs for natural gas during that time period. How did it get to that spot? Well, Ranking Member Langford, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there are certainly a lot of anecdotal pieces of information that I've been shared, but I don't know the whole story. Um, I have heard that um, that the lack of supply created the demand. I've also heard that the willingness of generators and utilities to pay whatever they could afford to pay in order to reliably serve load also contributed. But I can't tell you to what extent either of those drove that price as high as it did. That's one of the features we're gonna to have to determine at some points. Obviously, uh, ERCOT was uh, ready to pay a pretty high price to be able to get some natural gas. It drove up natural gas prices everywhere else when people were dealing with it. Uh, if, if there's one area that I think you and I need to be able to follow up on, it's this process of what's the combination of contract firm price, uh, spot prices, and what the dependency there and what percentage will be there, what amount of storage has to be there, and then how do we manage the price? I, obviously, I, I, I'm not one for price controls in this process. I do know our electricity has some price caps that are in it. Uh, but we've got to be able to figure out how to be able to manage that long term because we'll have other peak events, both summer and winter events. And uh, this will be in different regions as well. And the lessons learned from last February would be helpful to other RTOs across the country. Uh, Mr. Bryce, I do want to be able to drill down on something you had mentioned before about nuclear power. And we've got to be able to get that as a power source on ongoing. That's not happening right now with small modular or nuclear power. The reasons I hear most often is the cost uh, and the investment there, but the capital that's required to be able to do that initially. And the second issue has become the permitting uh, that no one wants to put $8 billion forward to be able to prepare for a nuclear power plant. If it's going to take 15 years in permitting and the uncertainty of who will be president and what the rules will be when they actually get to that spot. Uh, is that correct? Not correct? What do you think is the reason we're not seeing more nuclear power at this point? Well, Senator, thank you. I, I think you've hit on those exactly in the right way that the, as Ray Rothrock, who's a very a veteran venture capital investor has recently said, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the federal government pr present in terms of the licensing an uncontrollable risk for investors who want to build new nuclear plants. And that long term, the, the length of the, the licensing process is a gigantic hurdle. And so we've also had the recent experience of the, the, the power of the nuclear plant in, in South Carolina being canceled. Uh, the plant Vogel in, in Georgia is over time and over budget. 
Um, I think that it's clear as well that those plants, and generally speaking, are just too large. We need smaller reactors that are going to be lower cost that we can build at scale and do so quickly. And I've written quite a lot about this. I've had several guests on my podcast talking about how do we scale up and uh, a new nuclear uh, manufacturing sector in the United States. Uh, Robert Hargraves has a, has a company called Thorcon. His idea is to fabricate them in shipyards. But if I may uh, to revert to your question back to Mr. Nickel, I'd like to make one point on the gas grid and the electric grid. In August, I, I published a piece in the Dallas Morning News about what happened in ERCOT. And I made a point in that piece, and I, I want to reiterate it here. The, the natural gas grid and the electric grid in the United States have merged, but they're still being regulated separately. And I, your point about uh, maybe requiring or incenting uh, electric utilities, electric generators, rather, to have some amount of firm capacity, uh, I think is part of the answer. Uh, I know the Public Utility Commission of Texas is, is grappling with these issues now, trying to figure out how they assure the 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 the, the, pro, the uh, uh, on-time delivery of natural gas um, during peak events. Um, but we have to also understand that one of the reasons why we had such a high peak demand in Texas during winter storm Uri is because over 60% of the homes in Texas rely on electricity alone for heating so that that peak would not have been as high if we had had more homes using natural gas. Um, but I think that the fundamental issue in terms of that resilience, reliability, when it comes to natural gas and the interface with the electric grid is that those grids have to be more closely regulated uh, or, or the regulation has to be intertwined because those grids are interdependent. Thank you. Uh, it's helpful. Uh, Mr. Urgot, I want to ask you the same question about the uh, nuclear power and the permitting process there. Uh, you mentioned multiple different projects that are transmission projects that are quote unquote shovel ready that everyone knows are actually not shovel ready out there, that they have been a decade or more in process and they're currently stuck uh, with competing federal regulations or competing federal requirements preventing them from actually go forward. Uh, anytime I talk to anyone about nuclear power, they bring up the same issues. Why would I take the risk in $8 billion in capital if they can even get transmission lines up and going uh, across multiple states to be able to move? What do you see as the biggest barriers in the permitting side uh, for nuclear? Well, sure. So, first of all, there's there's uh, we, have to, we have to uh desegregate the two discussions about whether or not wind and solar at any point in the future can provide uh base load by by having energy storage so it is so it can meet the demand response at any given time. Um, we're still years away from that, especially where the development of the projects are now that are stymied, even though there's billions uh in private equity and 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 uh um, investor owned utility and then public utilities that are putting money behind it. So, uh, when it comes to 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 developing new nukes like we did uh, with several projects uh, while I was at the permitting council, it is even modest reductions uh, in, in, in in permitting times and increases in predictability and hard milestones had a direct relational uh, 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 correlation with a two to three percent increase in the debt and equity costs for these large um, for these large large owners, which are many times spread across multiple utilities. So at the bottom line, it's this. We have to be rational adults and look at the entire project schedule. The first two or three years are design and planning, the access and the supply uh, to the fuel loads, especially like where Palo Verde and others in Arizona uh, are still able to achieve those. And then there's the competing threat of whether or not after six or seven years of developing a 700, 800, 900 megawatt nuke plant um, are the offshore wind plants that are going to be able to do 1.2 uh, gigawatts and are going to have cables that are going to land in the energy storage facility. It's going to make this initial investment uh, economically infeasible. And so we're in this notch period. All this frustration and policy about wind and solar versus natural gas, and everyone talks about uh, above the board, all of the board energy solutions. We need it all. And the bottom line is at the end of the day, our job, not my job, potentially those that are policymakers, is to remove the headwinds and let the market dictate where the energy price and the spot and demand markets are going to end up without, without manipulations. Uh, and although folks talk about the subsidies of the ITC and the PTC, that that's about two percent of the benefit that can be a subsidy for for a new plant. The 20, 30 percent of project process cost that is borne on the backs of the eventual ratepayers is the big is the big issue. And nobody seems to want to fix that. And that just ends up rolling off the backs of these utilities that pass it on. Okay. Mr. Bryce, quick question on this. Uh, what do you estimate is the, the cost for new nuclear modular and how many of them would it take to replace? Uh, coal in the United States, because I hear that frequently being kicked around that will replace all the coal facilities with nuclear. 
And so I'm trying, I'm interested in what's the cost per of those facilities right now. Uh, we've already discussed the decade or more in permitting that it would take to be able to do each one of those. What's the cost for each one of those right now? And then how many would you actually have to build to, be, to replace coal in America? Uh, well, you're testing my memory here, uh, Senator, but um, I think the goal should be for new nuclear reactors that they should be at par with new natural gas, I mean, the, which is about $1,000 uh, per kilowatt. So a million dollars a megawatt is, you know, rule of thumb, uh, generally speaking, for new natural gas fired power plants. As far as how much the existing coal capacity in the United States, now you're really testing me because our coal fired capacity has been uh, has been declining rapidly over the last few years. The last time I looked, I think we're uh, consuming about as much coal for electricity in the United States as we were in the 60s. Although the EIA just did say uh, that we're going to set a new record uh, high for coal fired generation this year. Uh, as high as uh, taking us back to where we were in about 2014. But I think we would need a, at least 200 megawatts, probably more if we're going to, if memory serves, to replace existing coal in the United States. So how many facilities would that be to 200 megawatts of replacement? Well, of course, it depends on what size reactor is deployed, sir, because now you have companies like Oklo are developing a one and a half megawatt uh, electric uh, reactor, a very small reactor. Some of the other reactors are in that uh, new scale I've forgotten what that is a 20 or 30 watt a megawatt electric uh, reactor that can be built in uh, what they call a six pack i think uh, configuration but um, that's the key challenge sir is just what are what is going to be the optimal size for these new reactors um, and what are the what is the market going to demand and i'll make one other quick point here which is that what makes the entry of new nuclear into the market in the united states difficult is that electric electric consumption in the united states has been flat for 15 years we're at a different point today where in the United States than where we were in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when essentially all of the nuclear reactors in the U.S. were built, when where we were seeing uh, you know, large high single-digit increases in electricity demand in the United States. But over the last 15 years, despite population growth, uh, uh, electric generation in, in the United States has been flat at about 4,000 terawatt hours a year. Okay. Um, Mr. Bryce, let me drill down on one other concern that we've all got and we're watching on this sure. webinar. Uh, Europe and in many parts of Asia, they're dealing with availability of electricity right now. They've had a pretty significant challenge in multiple different areas in Europe and across China. Uh, we're watching that. We're also watching in India in capabilities. What are the key features that you see there in Europe, China, India, where they're not at, that they do not have enough electricity right now to be able to supply demand? What do we need to pay attention to there to make sure we don't have that here? Well, what my response, sir, was I think what we're seeing is what I call the iron law of electricity, which is that, and this is based on what I've seen traveling around the world over the last five years, India, Iceland, Lebanon, Puerto Rico, New York, Colorado, people, businesses, and, com and countries will do whatever they have to do to get the electricity they need. And so what we're seeing in Europe is a return to coal in a big way because natural gas is so expensive. Uh, we're seeing spot prices of coal in the international market now for the Newcastle benchmark at over $200 per ton. And in China, in some cases, over $300 per ton. We're seeing the deindustrialization across Europe because of a lack of natural gas. You see fertilizer plants being shut down, which will have knock-on effects in the slaughterhouses, knock-on effects in food supplies in the coming years because farmers don't have enough fertilizer. This is due to underinvestment in hydrocarbons. And now this is not a popular view, but this is the reality. The world still runs on hydrocarbons. And now we're seeing uh, that without enough natural gas, Europe is in, uh, is in crisis and it's affecting multiple industries where steel producers, aluminum producers in, in, in China are shutting down. We're seeing the knock on effects of not a lack of renewables, a lack of hydrocarbons. Uh, thank you for that. That's that's helpful to be able to get a context on. Uh, again, th this particular subcommittee, we deal with the issue of energy diversity to try to make sure that the United States maintains a diverse energy portfolio that works and that is reliable uh, and that's resilient enough to be able to manage it. We've obviously seen some gaps in our resiliency uh, in multiple areas with blackouts and things that are happening in California with what's happened uh, in the Great Plains in the Midwest uh, in uh, in the storm Uri uh, last February, but we've seen other areas as well. So we're going to continue to be able to work on this. Uh, Mr. Yonker, I have one last quick question for you as well, and, and I'm going to call you out on something. When there was a conversation on hydrogen earlier, uh, I was kind of watching your expression as I'm watching 
through the uh, Brady Bunch boxes uh, that I have on my screen here. And uh, I can see your expression when the hydrogen was being discussed as well. Is there anything that you would want to be able to contribute as well on the issue about hydrogen? I haven't studied it enough to have an opinion on hydrogen, but I, I certainly think that other grid flexibility solutions at scale uh, ought to be getting prioritized. We talked about demand side management. We haven't really talked about long duration storage, you know, which is stuck but in early commercialization between labs and other areas. So I think there's some solutions from a grid flexibility and a grid reliability standpoint that need significant investment uh, where the federal government can play a really important role. And, and this in many ways might be commercialization from the labs. This might be in grant programs like that are stuck in the uh, approved but yet appropriated uh, Energy Act of 2020. Chair Sinema, thank you uh, for the additional time in the second round of questions. I appreciate that for all of the folks that are testifying today. We very much appreciate not only your written testimony that you submitted, but your oral testimony as well. And I appreciate your engagement on these issues. It's uh, much needed in this season as we deal with a lot of very complicated issues right now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Senator Lankford, and thank you to all of our witnesses. With that, we've reached the end of today's hearing, and I appreciate all of your witnesses, all of the witnesses today for your time and testimony. And I want to thank all of my colleagues for their participation. This was a very important and a timely hearing, and I know there were a lot of questions that not everyone had an opportunity to ask. So I'll be submitting additional questions for the record so we can continue to examine this critical need. Um, as 15 days from today is Veterans Day, the hearing record will remain open for 16 days until 5 p.m. on Friday, November the 12th for the submission of statements and questions for the record. And with that, um, I will adjourn this hearing. Thank you.